through 16 of the entire chapter. The title of our sermon this morning is A Word from an Old Mess.
preaching the gospel every time I stand. Yes. Every time you do ministry, you are extending the work and the influence of those who poured themselves into you, mentored you, discipled you, pastored you. So we're going to do this musical example. I'm going to ask one person to just give me a favorite hymn, a traditional hymn, and then Paul's going to start playing it. And when I feel like it, I'm going to take it from him. Just going to put my fingers right over his, and I'm going to take it from him. He's going to slide off the bench. I'm going to keep the song going. Then when he feels like it, he's going to come take it from me. And we're going to keep the song going, even though the players change. Let this be a metaphor for your life and ministry. For you will play only so many years on the earth, and then you've got to slide off the bench. That's called death. You can slide off the bench. But if you do it right, the music keeps going on. Yes, amen. The work doesn't get buried. We bury Pastor Ellis, but the ministry goes amen. on. Someone has said, God buries his workers, but never his work. Amen. So as you hear this hopefully seamless song, let this be a reminder that we, we do our best. We come, we play, we do our best work. We sing, we motivate, we encourage, we feed the hungry, we take mission trips, we uh, co concern ourselves with children, ministry to children. We keep the song going, but then one day it's over. Amen. Ministry continues. The song continues to be sung. The story continues to get told. All praise be to God. All right, I need one person to give me a, a thing. Yes, Judy. You know, Mighty Fortress is our God. I, I can read it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to get something we don't have to read. No. It is well my soul. It is well with my soul. Is this good?
God, we thank you that you use us to give to the world a song. We pray that we would be your instruments and we would sing our song, deliver our song to the world. We thank you for those now sleeping death who sang the song, who played the song, who preached the gospel, who worked with children, who did mission trips, who encouraged us, who mentored us, who taught us. We thank you that we have the privilege of keeping the song going, mm -hmm. keeping the music going, keeping the ministry going. As we slide off the bench, help, help us to finish well. Yes. We pray for those coming after us. The generation following is going to keep the song going. Yes. Pray you encourage them right now. Teach them your ways. And as they look at us, may we not fail them, disappoint them. Now open to us your glorious word. We give you thanks. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And the people said, Amen. In this 23rd chapter of Joshua, and the one following, 24th chapter and last chapter of the book, we have Joshua's farewell address to Israel. One writer I read said that chapter 23 has Joshua speaking to the elders, and then in chapter 24 he speaks to all of Israel. That is not correct. The text doesn't bear that out. It appears that he's speaking to a gathering of leaders and all Israel in both addresses. So you see there in chapter 23, verse 2, and Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and said to them, and he speaks to them, 24.1, then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented, and they presented themselves before God. So he's speaking to the assembled Israelites, the leaders, the lay people, everybody. And it's very realistic. He's speaking of leaving the earth. He's speaking of dying. He's speaking of sliding off the bench, so to speak, and having another come and keep the song going, just as Moses died and Joshua kept the song going, so to speak. He says, essentially, I'm old and I'm dying. You know, we're wise to listen to our elders. Yes. They are walking repositories of wisdom. I have always enjoyed older people. Yeah. Always. In April 2009, I was visiting a nursing home, and I wrote this down so I know exactly what it was. Uh, I was visiting a, a woman who was a friend of my, the mother of one of my friends in Dallas, and her roommate was a woman named Velton Walker. She's probably deceased now. This is seven years ago, and at the time I met Mrs. Belton Walker, she was 95. Mm -hmm. I was told she was 95, and I said, I, I understand that you are uh, a seasoned person. You've been on the earth a long time. She said, I am 95. <laughs> she said, baby, I'm not old, I've just been here longer. <laughs> I'm old, I've just been here all the time. <laughs> I thank God for my elders. I had the extraordinary privilege of knowing all four of my grandparents. The farmers and the Englishes both lived in Harlem a block apart. One on 146th Street, one on 147th Street. And so we visited our grandparents every week. Every week, my mother would uh, drive us down to Harlem to our grandparents' house. Sometimes we saw them twice in one week or so, but we, uh, we saw them at least once a week, every week. What a privilege I had. And I never thought, I, I never, ever, ever thought, oh, I've got to go see my grandparents. I, I thought, I get to see my grandparents. I was like that until, until the last one left the earth, and I had three of them until I was an, when I was an adult. I, I still had living grandparents. Last one died when I was in my 40s. What a privilege. Yes. What a privilege. 
Let's look at Joshua 23. This is an old man talking. And it's not that we have got to hear Joshua. We get to hear him. By the time we meet him in this text, according to chapter 23, uh, verse 1, he is an old man. He's advanced in age. If you flip over to chapter 24, it'll tell you exactly how old he is. He's 110. Wow. Says the 29th verse of chapter 24. This book is the bridge between the law and the judges. The book of Deuteronomy closes with the death of Moses. That's the end of the first five books of the law. And after Joshua will come the books that talk about the judges and their leadership. And in between there is the book of Joshua. I want to look at Joshua, not so much the narratives, the stories in the book. I want to look at Joshua himself. And I want to extract from this text, from his farewell address, some lessons for life some observations. I want to celebrate them with Joshua and I want to celebrate them with you. If you recall that Moses was told, I'm going to show you the promised land, but you're not going to get to enter in. And it was Joshua who would actually take them in. Henrietta Mears, in her wonderful little book called What the Bible is All About, says of the promised land, it's God's to give. It's ours to possess. It's God's to give. It's ours to possess. So Joshua is the one who's going to lead Israel into the promised land to possess it. I want to extract a few lessons. I won't tell you how many. I'm just going to talk. Uh, and, and in the next 22 minutes, I just simply want your undivided attention. Might even be fewer minutes than that. But I, I want to simply extract some lessons from this text. First of all, Joshua says, and I, I simply want to celebrate this with you. I won't even flesh out the point. I'll just make the observation. Our advocate has been identified. Yes. Our advocate has been identified. It's in verse 3 of this farewell address in chapter 23 that I just want to camp on for a minute and simply make this point. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has fought for you. An advocate is one who, who fights for, who defends the cause of another. You are the advocate, Joshua says, of God. You have fought in our behalf. Everything good that has happened to us has happened to us because you, O oh God, have gone ahead of us. And he says to Israel in his farewell address, Joshua says, I want to remind you that when those nations were put to flight, it was the Lord God who did that. When you were delivered, it was the Lord God who did that. When you won the victory in your skirmishes, it was the Lord who fought for you. There's a memory verse that I want you to just take down. You'll, you'll enjoy knowing this verse. In such a short verse, you could recite it regularly. You could print it out and hang it on your mirror. See it every morning as you wash your face. It's Psalm 118, verse 23. I want you to just take that down and you know it. Psalm 118, verse 23. And this is what it says. This was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our lives. That's what Joshua says as he looks back over his entire life. This was the Lord's doing. Our advocate has been identified. It was not me. It was not my prowess. It was not my skill. It was not my education. All the good that has happened to me and for me is because the Lord, our God, has fought for us. Wow. Just let that sink in a minute. We have one who goes ahead of us and fights our battles. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. I want you to look back at all the things that you have had to deal with in the last year. And somehow you made it. You're here today. You still, you, you survived. I want to remind you what the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Psalm 118 verse 23. Our advocate has been identified. Joshua says, now don't, don't get it twisted. You all are not all that great. It was the Lord God who fought for you. 
give you a second lesson. Our foes have been expelled. It is our God who goes ahead of us, and it is our God who does the very specific work of expelling our enemies. The nations are out, and Israel is in. Look at verse 5 of our text. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you. Then who? Well, the, the, the nations. And drive them out of your sight. So you shall possess their land. As the Lord your God promised you. You are going to have riches. You're going to have opportunities. You're going to have food that you did. You're going to eat food that you didn't grow. You're going to enjoy pastures that you did not till. You're going to enjoy experiences that you could not have even created or fabricated or even imagined. And it is because the Lord is going to expel your foes and get rid of your enemies in your behalf. <coughs> what you think about the nations, the foes that have been simply taken out of your sight. It is the Lord's doing Here's a third lesson. Our success has been assured. Our advocate has been identified. Our foes have been expelled. Our success has been assured. Now be careful here. When we talk about success, for every spiritual reality, every spiritual truth, there is an equally compelling secular counterfeit of that truth. Yes. Yes. So for instance, there is something called success in the Bible, but there is a worldly definition of success that is equally compelling. And if you're not careful, you could buy into the world's definition of success and completely miss spiritual success. Come here, let me show it to you in the text. Chapter 23, look at verse 6. Therefore, be courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right or to the left. And lest you go among these nations, these who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God, as you've done to this day. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations, but as for you, no one will be able to stand against you in this day, to this day. Ah. Turn with me to chapter 1 of Joshua, and then I'm going to give you a definition of success from my own pen. I'm going to offer a definition. I want to go to chapter 1 of Joshua. This is probably the better known passage on Success, for it actually uses the word success in chapter 1, verse 7. Only be strong and courageous that you may observe to do all according to the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Our success has been assured, says Joshua, but it is as we follow the Lord our God. So let me give you a definition of success from my pen. Success is a dedication to a declaration without deviation. Success is a dedication to a declaration without deviation. Notice, more than once, Joshua is told that the only way this is going to work, the only way you're going to be successful is if you lock on to my word, the words of my law, and you do not deviate, you do not turn to the right or to the left. It is a dedication to a declaration without deviation. We don't, we don't turn away from this word. This is, is what you need. You want to be successful? Get in this word. Oh, you know, Pastor, I'm, not, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a job. I want to be a success. You know, I'm, I'm trying to buy my dream house. I want to be a success. You can have the house. 
and the car and the money in the bank and still be a failure in the eyes of God. Because for every spiritual truth, there's an equally compelling secular counterfeit. And you could buy the secular definition of success and think you're successful. And God will say to you, but you, you've deviated from my word. Amen. In my view, God says, you're a failure. And let's face it, his are the only eyes that count. Amen. But our future, how our success has been assured as we walk with God. And Joshua says to the folks, don't. Don't start looking at those other nations and their gods. In fact, don't even mention those gods' names. Don't even utter, don't even give them the dignity of uttering those deities' names. And don't marry their daughters, and don't take on their values, and don't marry their sons. I want you to stay in the word of Yahweh. Yes, yes. And don't deviate. Amen. Let me give you a fourth truth here. You're tracking with me. Our advocate has been identified. Our foes have been expelled. Our success has been assured. Our future has been secured. Our future has been secured. However, it has contingencies. We do have this bright future, but it all hangs on whether or not we will go into the future with God. It, it really, it, it bothers me to see People who say, listen, I am, I am in pursuit of a dream, a goal, and I can't do this whole spiritual thing right now. I gotta, I gotta do this. And if I have time, I might circle back around and get with God. But right now, I gotta do this. And it's, it's so sad to see people do that because the truth is, you can pursue your dreams with God, Amen. in God. Yeah. I remember I passed a church in, in the 80s in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and there was a young man who had become, started coming to our church and became part of our congregation. And then he was absent for weeks, maybe a couple of months. And I, we went and tried to track him down and couldn't find him. And, and he, he surfaced again. I think he changed his phone number or something. Anyway, he, he surfaced. And I said, man, where you been? And this is what he said. I'll never forget this. I wanted to laugh in his face, but I, you know, I, I didn't want to be unkind. But he said, well, Pastor, I bought a house. And I've been working on it. And I'm waiting for the, you know, and what happened? Did, did your mama die in the house? I mean, what? I'm still not understanding your absence. But that was, his, that was his whole answer. I haven't been around because I bought a house and I've been working on my house. You mean you can't, you can't rehab a house and worship God? You mean, you mean to tell me this house takes all your energy so that you don't even have two hours on a Sunday morning to come and give praise to the God who got you the house? Another young lady said to me, oh, Pastor, you know, I'm in school now. And? What, what, does that, what does that mean? Oh, so God is supposed to go on hold for four years while you pursue your degree? Well, isn't that precious? Or oh, he'll be glad to have you back. <laughs> the future is secure, but the, pre the presupposition here is that we will go into the future with God. In fact, there are such contingent. Well, I don't want you to think I'm making this up. Come on, let me show it to you in the text. It's right, right here in the text. Uh, look at verse 10. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. And that's a repeat of a principle that he, a truth that he uttered earlier. The Lord God goes ahead of you and fights your battles and, and you, you'll do well, he says. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Or else, if, you indeed, if indeed you do go back 
and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go into them, and they to you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you. So he said, you, listen, you've got a bright future. You've got battles that you haven't even fought yet, but, but the Lord's going to give you the victory. However, watch yourself. Your future has been secured, but victory is tied to obedience. Amen. As you follow me and as you walk with me, I will make your path straight. And I'll make the crooked places straight and the rough places plain. Yeah. But a presupposes you'll stay with me, you'll track with me. The future is secure, but it has contingencies. There's a there's a there's a buck here. If you go back, verse 12. Claim to the remnant of, the, remnant of these nations is not going to bode well for you. You have a bright future, but don't become idolatrous and think you're going to have the same kind of future you would have had if you clung to the Lord our God. That brings me very easily to another lesson. From this old man, this 110 year old man, and that is that our options have been presented. The late Norman Cousins, journalist, thinker, philosopher, said in his book Human Options the only thing that separates humans from animals is that humans can entertain options. If dogs just do what dogs do, they don't say, no, oh, see, plan A, plan B, plan C. They just do what dogs do. Humans alone, only species that can actually entertain options and consequences and look at things and hold them up to the light and turn them around and consider this versus that. Our future has been secured and our options have been presented. Just as Israel has options they can exercise, so does God. And he's under no obligation to drive their enemies out. He says, I will drive your enemies out, and I'm assuming you're going to follow me. A major commitment has been made here. One of the most prominent lessons from this farewell address is the sense of resolve on the part of Joshua. I want to suggest a sixth lesson, and it is that a major commitment has been made by this old man. And I, I want my life to be marked by commitments I have made. I want it clear that I've made my commitment and that I'm sticking to it. It's the reason I'm still married after 35 years. Amen. Let's keep it real. <laughs> if you have just Gone with your own meanings, your own moods. Some of us wouldn't have been married 35 months. You know I'm telling the truth. You were not into the marriage very long, but we were not into the marriage very long. Before many of us thought, was this the smartest thing I've done? <laughs> Maybe I should have you start entertaining again options, but a commitment was made. And we who are still married have just simply fought to keep that commitment. Joshua speaks of his commitment and his resolve, and it's so firm. It's seen more in chapter 24 in his second farewell address or the continuation of his address. But let me, let me highlight, in fact, it's the only verse in chapter 24 that I want to raise up. And it is that well-known verse in uh, chapter 24, verse 15. Many of you know it. You might not have remembered where it was from. Here it is. 24, 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yeah, you know the verse. Even if you didn't know where it was, you know the verse. Even if you didn't know the address, you know the verse, don't you? 
Some years ago, some friends of mine, whom I knew from Nyack, New York, were in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for a relative's graduation from a university there. And by that time, I was pastoring in Pittsburgh, and they called and said, we're coming to Pittsburgh for our niece's graduation. I said, oh, I'd be delighted to see you. So I had a reception for them at my house, these visitors from Nyack, New York. One of them, a woman whom I knew very well, now home with the Lord, was a chain smoker. I mean, she would literally smoke maybe a pack a day and would go from one cigarette, I saw her sometimes, put one out and immediately reach for another one. Just cigarette after cigarette, and uh, she, she died of lung cancer, actually, uh, several years later. She was at my house, and I remember getting a folding chair for her and putting it right outside my front door. <laughs> And I said to her, she said, I can't smoke in your house. I said, no, ma'am. I said, but it's a chair. <laughs> and she went out there several times to take a smoke break. Now, I cannot control smokers all around the country or even in my city or even in my neighborhood or my apartment complex. But I can say with authority and confidence what goes on in my house. <laughs> Because that's the commitment I've made. Yes. That mine shall be a non-smoking house. I cannot run your house. Yes, right, right. But I can say, as for me and my house, yes. we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will be non-smokers. I can say what goes on in this house. And you've got to have this Joshua-like resolve and be able to declare what shall go on here. I can't, I can't rule the nation. I can't change the whole city. But I can tell you what's going to happen here. Yeah. Because this is my house. Listen to Joshua. Now, you all have options. There are gods all over the place. You've you got deities here and there calling for your allegiance. You've got the gods of the Amorites, the gods of the Canaanites, and Jebusites, Perizzites, Mosquitoites, all the gods. <laughs> You, you can serve whomever you want to. And I can't tell you who to serve. But as for me and my Say it with me. For me and my house. This is my house. Listen to Joshua. He's 110. Still talking about what's going to happen in his house. He has, a, every one of us has a sphere of influence. You, you can't change all of Atlanta, but you can sure talk about this is my <laughs> If I ever found out that Timothy was shacking up with somebody, and he is not now, to my knowledge. <laughs> he is a male roommate. But if I ever found out he was shacking, he's an adult. I can't stop him. I'm too far away. He's too big. I can't. You know, I can't do anything. But if he came to Atlanta with his common law wife, with the woman with whom he's playing house, I could tell him. I don't know what y'all do in Texas, but in Y'all won't be sleeping in the same room <laughs> or in the same bed. Not in, not in my house. Yes. Yes. Amen. That's Joshua yes. in this text. Yes. A commitment has been made. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. I will follow the God who has revealed himself in the law. I will follow the God of the ancient words. And I will not deviate from his law, neither to the right nor to the left. I want to be successful, and I want to finish strongly. Yes, yes. How about you? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. He can't eliminate the idol, Israel's idolatry. He can't eliminate their tendency to follow other gods, but he can sure make a declaration about his house. I'm just going to put these last two together, and I'm done. I'll be right on the schedule. Life ends 
God does not. Amen. Joshua says, with no hint of fear, Behold this day, verse 14 of chapter 23, I'm going the way of the earth. That is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die. Wow. I, I love that. Just no, no hint of anxiety. In this one verse, you have the sobering juxtaposition of mortal humanity and the eternal God. I'm going the way of all the earth, but God stands sure. And nothing that the Lord our God has uttered shall fail to come to pass. Amen. We're living right now on the promises of God. Yes. Who is ever true, ever faithful, ever reliable. Life ends, Joshua says, I'm going to die. And a chapter later, he does. I'm going the way of all earth. I'm going back to the dust. But the God who has spoken to you, Israel, will not die. So the final lesson, I put these two together. Life ends, God does not. So watch yourself. <laughs> if that's true, watch yourself. Just as obedience leads to victory, transgression leads to despair and separation from the blessing of God. I was uh, tweaking these notes, going over these notes last night, and I, I didn't underline them in my Bible, but I, but I should have. I noted how many times, more than once, Joshua talks about the good things and the harmful things. The good things, the good things, the good things, the good land, the good things. So in verse 15 of chapter 23, Therefore it shall come to pass that as, as all the good things have come upon you which the Lord your God has promised you, so the Lord will bring upon you all harmful things until he has destroyed you from the good land. See the good land, the good things, the harmful things. Hey, watch yourself. Yes. Choose good. Yes. Walk with God so that the good things may become yours. Walk with God, watch yourself in such a way that you avoid the harmful things. And listen to the old man. Yes. He's got good counsel. Yes. And you're also going the way of the earth. Don't let it frighten you. You need not fear death. Choose the life that leads to the good things, the good land, and the good God. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for this old man and for what we could learn from a 110-year-old. We thank you for Brother Joshua and for people like him who have such resolve and who finish strongly and who say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. May we be like them. I pray for anyone in this sacred space who has been filled with indecision, who's wishy-washy about everything from what to wear to whom to serve. I pray that they would be people of resolve like Joshua and follow you with their whole heart. While your heads are still bowed, you're in a prayer mode. I want to close this service by asking you, sir, madam, if you're here today, you'll say, Pastor Farmer, I've never heard these words from Joshua. And I've also never made the kinds of commitments he's made. I've never made the kinds of observations about God that he's made. I sure would like to know the God of Joshua and the God of the people who follow Jesus. If you would like to talk with someone about new life, about new resolves, about new commitments, about new points of focus, this is your day. 
As we sing this closing prayer, O oh Master, let me walk with you in lowly paths of service free. While we sing, would you please be brave enough, courageous enough to come down front and meet me? I will shake your hand, I will pray with you as the service ends. By your coming, you simply say, Pastor Farmer, I would like to talk with someone about how I may have this life that you've described as Joshua's life and as the life of so many in this room. Father, we pray that you continue to speak to us in these closing moments. Amen. If you're able, would you please stand as we sing this closing hymn and you'd like to read the words in your hymnal. It's found in 504.